am thrilled. And now this is also cutting edge work because it's technically, it's on the press. It will be hot off the press in October. So uh, I have a new book out, Race on Campus, Debunking Myths with Data. It's a nice cover. They did a good job. Um, and so I'm excited to share a little bit from that with you today. I was actually tempted to can this presentation and just show you photos of my eight month old boy. But <laughs> we can do that. We can do that at lunch. All right, so we know that so much more uh, than ever, or it feels, maybe it's not more than ever, I don't know, but it feels like just misinformation is just everywhere, right? Fake news, how did that become a term? Uh, this year's AERA, or the coming year's AERA theme is understanding educational research in a post-truth era. Um, we know that certainly society is just rife with assumptions and stereotypes and Unfortunately, you know, social media is helpful in some ways, but can it, it can also become an echo chamber, right? And uh, we know that our data is getting sold all over the place and things are getting targeted to us. Um, there's just flat out misinformation that's just all over the place. And it's, it's troubling and it's really interesting. And I think it, you know, it brings up interesting conversations and opportunities to talk about what is truth, right? So in the academy, we're used to having to fight for the idea that there could be some level of truth, right? Or that there could be some, you know, consistency, right, at least. Um, but, you know, I think people are concerned. They're like, how are we going to know, teach people, right, what is actually true? Because people just make stuff up, it feels like, these days. So when it comes to higher education, I'm sure you all know uh, your relatives when they say, what do you do? Oh, how do you do that? Um, everyone seems to have an opinion, and especially race in higher education. Uh, people have a lot of different opinions. So the, some of the common pushback I often hear are things like diversity, right? What good is diversity if everyone sticks together, right? Um, or race, why do you care about, why do we care about race? That's something that's in the past, that's something that just divides people. Um, there's a great book out that sums up the popular, you know, lament, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria by Beverly Daniel Tatum, which is a fantastic book. But this comment sort of summarizes this bewilderment, right, from people that, you know, they to even see a table of people who might be of the same race, ethnicity, just eating together innocently, right? That somehow that is cause for our concern and we need to have, you know, that is a symptomatic of something that's wrong with higher education. And then also a lot of pushback, of course, against affirmative action continues. The idea that it's something that just helps rich minorities is something I've heard. I've said, you know, affirmative action is just for people like Malia Obama, or why would we need anything like that, right? Um, so there's a lot of, just people have all of these opinions. Okay, and so, you know, just to take a step back, this is very meta, right? We hear the opinions, but oftentimes we don't stop and think, where do the opinions come from? Or why do people think that they have this, everyone's an expert suddenly on, in higher education. They're like, why do you need to get a PhD in higher education, right? I went to college, I know all of that stuff. So why is there no shortage of opinion? Well, a lot of people fortunately have gone to college, so they think that, they might think, well, I went to college, so I know a lot about what colleges, how colleges work, never mind that every college is different, and then even within the same campus, you have many different students who are having very different experiences. The media, right, um, and this is hard because sometimes, you know, I think it's important that we can laugh at ourselves in higher education a little bit, but um, the media, you know, they don't pick on the things that are kind of more innocent. They take things and they make them sound like just this one thing, you know, some random professor's obscure syllabus, right, is somehow evidence that just society is just collapsing, right? Um, so the media will take these ideas and run with them, right? Like trigger warnings, right? That, I think they did some survey and they found out that just a very small percentage of faculty ever actually used something like that. Um, but of course, the media just went wild with it, right? And so now people, there's this illusion that it is something that's common, right? And it's like, oh, you know, you're not doing that. Um, and you know, other ideas about where everyone's, it's, it's, it's in some ways, I think this, era of distrust where no one is an expert, so then everyone is an expert. And I think actually the Bible talks some <laughs> about this, you know, this period where everyone thinks that they know what is right, what's right, and um, maybe we're in, we're in end times, who knows. <laughs> okay, so uh, there's a great book by Daniel Arely, um, and I think the title sums it uh, up very well. 
It's uh, the idea that, so on one hand, we think we know everything, right? We think we know everything. I have an eight month baby. In five years, he's gonna think he knows everything. Um, but we are human beings. We know that we are, uh, we have flaws, right, certainly. Um, and research from the field of behavioral economics, um, social psychology, et cetera, they d it does a great job of showing us actually, number one, not only do we not know everything, but we're actually really irrational. And we're actually quite predictably irrational in certain ways. We make the same cut ups, our brain takes the same shortcuts. Um, you know, we're oftentimes fooled. Um, but we think we know it all, of course, human pride, hubris. Okay. So uh, a book that does a great job of this, um, it's a big, thick book that has a pencil on top. You may have seen it in an airport bookstore. Um, Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, the pioneering work of um, psychologists uh, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman. And they talk about, um, in their work, they talk about system one and system two. So they talk about how the brain it has these multiple ways of um, processing information. And system one is the one that's more intuitive. It's the one that's more likely to jump to a conclusion. It's quicker, hunches. It's the one that has to go, 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 right? System two, slower, right? More deliberative, takes the time to think about weighing other perspectives, looking for disconfirming evidence, thinking, trying to look outside of just your individual purview. So two systems. Guess which one we rely on more? Anyone want to guess? System one, right? When your social media is like beep, 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 like how, it's amazing anyone does any thinking at all, right? <laughs> any thinking. Spoiler, system one. System one, and you know what? Okay, I don't wanna harp on system one. We need system one to get through the day. You need system one to just brush your teeth and you know, you don't wanna be in your car and thinking about what does it mean to press my foot on the brake pedal? <laughs> you don't wanna be consciously have deliberative thought. You know, there is the need for a lot of behavior to be automatic, to be quick, to be intuitive, to be muscle memory, all of that good stuff. Um, so system one, and I'm quite fond of my system one. So when we think about how reliant we are on system one for day to day, pretty much everything, right? Um, what does that mean for us in higher ed, right? In a system one world, a system one dominant world. So, and I would argue, and in the book I argue, um, that what we think we see and know about higher education is often not what's going on. And really we are wired, we are innately wired to stumble. Right? Biblical parallel, anyone? <laughs> uh, we are wired to stumble. Um, and so given that, right, we know that we are flawed and broken creatures, why should it be any surprise that we actually don't get a lot of the time what's really going on in higher ed? Um, and it's really important for us to recognize that we walk around with our blinders on. Okay. And so just to explain a little bit of the setup of the book, what I do is I talk about, you know, how we are wired to stumble, et cetera. And so with that, I go through different myths. So I go through different pervasive myths in higher education as related to race relations. So things like the idea that we don't need affirmative action anymore, or the idea that um, students of color only self-segregate, or the idea that students of color pervasively are mismatched in higher education. So I take each of those myths and I try to tackle them with, well, what does that data actually say? Um, so that's a big part of it. So actually drawing on the research to help understand and debunk these myths. But at the same time, I get a little meta. And within each chapter, there's a chunk that looks at research actually from um, cognitive science and psychology that really tries to get to, you know, but why do we think this? Like, why might we think that really all we think is that black students just sit in the cafeteria together all day and that is their defining experience in higher education. Like what is it in our brains that is tricking us, right, into thinking of that? And so I think it's kind of a fun concept. It's out in October, pre-order today on Amazon. <laughs> All right, so cognitive bias. And so this is actually uh, really influenced um, by um, one of my best friends is a cognitive scientist named Ji Son who teaches at Cal State LA. And I think I just picked up on these ideas from hanging out with her over the years. And cognitive biases speak to the ways that our brains are really suspect to being fooled um, or that the things that influence what sticks in the brain or sticks right. So just one example of this. So it influences what we think is right, right, even if it might not truly be right. Um, 
So one example of a common uh, cognitive bias um, that affects probably many of us is called the availability heuristic. And this one was actually pioneered by Tversky and Kahneman themselves. They were like BFFs, um, Nobel Prize winner BFFs. Um, and it refers to how, for our brains, what sticks, the information that often sticks, is information that's memorable, but most of all, easily recallable. So it kind of sounds like self-explanatory that it's easier to remember things are mem that are memorable, but someone actually had to document this because we would think, oh no, I actually remember things that are right, or I remember things that are tracked, backed up by data. And we would all like to think that of ourselves, but really we remember what's easy to remember. And it's really easily recallable or available in our brains. And so something like I heard on the news, right? So you hear, so even though, for instance, fortunately, as a mother, <laughs> I need to remind myself that cases of like child abduction or, you know, those terrible worst case scenarios that you see that happen to children, the rates of that have gone down. Thank goodness, I need to remind myself that. But you just, all it takes is to hear one case and they're all really terrible. And then when you're like a new, inexperienced first time parent, they just stick out in your head and they're easy to remember. And then that comes to define, right? That becomes the lens of, um, you know, new parenthood <laughs> in America. Um, and so, Bringing this to higher education, the things that stick out that are easy to remember oftentimes are the ones where everyone's like, well, I know what really goes on in college. Did you hear about this? Right? So example of the campus cafeteria, right? When people are like, oh, all the black kids and the Asian kids and the Latino kids, et cetera. So it's this very powerful image. And it's someone I kind of like to poke fun of because has any, I've been a, <laughs> working in higher education and being on college campuses, I've been at at least like three very earnest town hall meetings, right, on race relations, where everyone's trying to think like, how can we make our campus a better, more inclusive place? And someone is like, well, we just need to sit with someone different from us in the cafeteria. And you know, and I, people have even proposed like, let's have sit outside your comfort zone day. And you know, that's beautiful. Beautiful. Like, that's great, but it's this idea that the cafeteria, right, it reflects this idea that if everyone just sat together for one day, all of our problems would be healed, right? And it also reflects this idea that the cafeteria itself is the problem, the symptom, all in one, you know, let alone like, okay, I could make you a whole list about why there are problems on this, at this institution. I'm pretty sure none of them are stemming from where people want to eat, right? <laughs> So anyway, but it's powerful. It's a very powerful symptom, symbol. And there's probably research on cognitive bias to explain like why this is just so easy to latch onto and it's easy solution, right? So I yeah, well, how do you fix the problem? Well, you make people sit together. Okay, problem solved, right? No, okay. But it leads to this perception that our campuses are stubbornly balkanized by race. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't times when people do wanna sit together with people who are like them in the cafeteria. I have sat in the cafeteria many times with other Asian Americans. So is there some truth to this? Somewhat, yes, but is it the whole story? No, because how often, when you're a college student, how, often, how long do you spend in the cafeteria? Two, three hours, most? Three hours is a lot of time to spend in the cafeteria. Most of them don't eat breakfast. No, they eat lunch and dinner quite quickly too. Okay, so is there truth, some truth, but is it the whole story? So the cafeteria is just a sliver of what goes on in people's days. And our obsession with the cafeteria as the symbol for all that is long really negates understanding that students of color, we have a slew of studies, I didn't even bother putting them on the slide because there's so many. <laughs> we have so many studies that show that students of color have the highest rates of cross-racial interaction, the highest rates of interracial friendship, engagement on campuses just because you spend some day hanging out with people who might be of the same race of you does not mean that you can't spend time other times of the day <laughs> hanging out with people who are different from you. So in fact, and I talk about this in the book, ethnic student organizations, right? So this is another one. Besides, it's like the most wanted, most wanted cafeteria, most wanted like a black student union or Asian American student club, right? As like the worst offenders. So I took this, vote, this quote from this very earnest student columnist at the Georgetown Voice, and they talk about, they're saying the popularity of cult student cultural associations, the establishment of cultural housing has been counterproductive to the values of Georgetown wants to instill through diversity. 
I respect and admire the work of these clubs. At least he said that, right? <laughs> Oftentimes, the diversity advance also fosters an environment in which each ethnic group remains with their own. So, right, we often hear this, self-segregation, that's another boogeyman in higher education, race relations. Um, yeah, okay. So, why do people think, why, but why do these images, right? The cafeteria, the student club, right? Why do these people stick in their head? Why do these things stick in people's head? I would say a big part of it is the availability heuristic. It's because they're memorable. They're easy, sticky targets in your brain. And especially if you're used, our society socializes us to think that white people are sort of the norm. They just blend in, right? So, you know, it's funny, because I used to work at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, which is a great place, but it was at least 80% white. And you had tables and tables and tables of white people sitting together, and people still ask me why the black students sat together. And I was like, come on, can you give them a break, right? But when, in our dominant society, when white kind of blends in, right, and people of color stick out, right? We're not the norm, and so we become memorable. Um, and to some people, threatening. Just the, I'm just trying to eat my fries, right, <laughs> for one hour of the day, and suddenly, you know, I am all that is wrong with higher education. Okay, but did you know it's not only that, hey, you, faculty in the front, stop whispering. Okay. <laughs> I've known Chris. <laughs> I've known Chris for way long, so. Okay. Hey, focus, focus. All right, so. <laughs> Okay, so not only, okay, so not only is I think the cafeterias, you know, and the clubs that get hated on so often, uh, it's not just that they have a neutral effect. Participation in ethnic student organizations, one study I did with my colleague Nick Bowman at the University of Iowa, we found that participation in ethnic student organizations was linked with actually higher rates of cross-racial interaction for overall, the overall student population and in particular for black and Latinx students. Higher levels of interracial engagement for these students who are involved in these clubs that are supposedly so decisive and so balkanizing, right? Why is this? Okay, so in uh, the book I talk about, um, here's providing the interpretation to the data. How ethnic student organizations, um, and maybe sitting with your same race friends at the cafeteria once in a while, they provide a place for students of color to refuel, especially on a predominantly white campus or a campus that might not be the most compositionally diverse. It's draining to interact across race. It can be. It can be. As I mentioned, people have asked me, like, oh, your English is so great. You know, that doesn't happen on a day to day basis. Um, but, you know, in many ways, uh, it can intera interracial interaction, while there are many benefits, it can also um, be challenging, right? It's something that can require more cognitive resources than just the autopilot and the assumptions of when you think everyone is like you. Even when you're with people who you think are like you, they're actually not really like you. <laughs> but still, it's easy to make that assumption. So ethnic student organizations, the one or two hours they might meet like every other week, right? When I was in college, I was in this club and you know, we didn't meet every day, we met like every other week <laughs> for two hours, right? So these organizations can provide a space where students of color can refuel from these cognitive depleting interactions um, and go back into the community to engage across race. Um, and you know, it's not just that it's cognitively depleting sometimes to interact continuously with people who are different from you, but you can think of the more different you are, the more likely you're likely to get questions, right? About, you know, where are you from? Or um, what was it like at your high school? Or questions that might even border on the line of racial microaggressions or questions that show utter ignorance. And you're having to explain yourself over and over again. That can be tiring. Right? So just being able to spend an hour or two, once a week, every other week, in a space where you might have to answer other questions, but you're not going to be answering the questions that are linked to your racial ethnic, that question of like, why is your hair like that? Or, you know, why do your parents, where your parents come from, et cetera. You might be answering other questions, <laughs> but you're not answering the questions that you might in a more predominantly white setting. And so our theory, you know, our working interpretation of the data, is that these involvement in these groups gives students of color a place to refuel, so then they can go out and interact more across race. And they actually have, um, there's a documented, at least correlation, right, higher levels of cross-racial interaction, so which we found when controlling for other measures as well. So, 
just to summarize, um, the availability, availability heuristic. So it can help us explain why things like the racially divided cafeteria and the ethnic student organizations, why those things, they're easy to remember, right? And of course there's the broader forces of like racism and why people don't understand the need for people of color to congregate with each other and why that can be seen as threatening, right? So we don't want to underplay that. But in terms of what's actually going on in our brains, there's an interplay, right? Where some of these things become easy to remember, they become emblematic, right? The data tell a very different story, and we know that students of color balance both same race and cross-racial friendships in interactions. And not only that, but a healthy campus racial climate supports both same race and cross-racial engagement in interactions. And so it's not just one or the other, it's more of a both and. Okay, so why do we have so much cognitive bias, right? Why are we wired in such problematic ways? Well, life is really busy. There's a lot of stuff to remember. You know, I have to write stuff down or else it just falls out of my head these days. And our brains go on autopilot. And this is actually part of the actual justification and explanation for why diversity in higher education matters. Because we are oftentimes on autopilot we make assumptions about how the world around us works, but then when someone from a different background and oftentimes a different racial ethnic background who says, hey, actually, that's not my experience. Let me tell you something different. Or when I was an instructor, or when I was a first time professor at Miami of Ohio, I had a really powerful moment in the classroom where I was talking, I was, giving, I was making fun of my mother, basically, and I was talking about this story where when we were little, she would threaten us, like, if you don't do this, and her threat was, her very problematic threat was, you're going to marry a truck driver. That was her threat, right? <laughs> it's terrible, it's terrible, right? And I knew it was terrible growing up just because it was just my mom and I knew it was terrible. But I had never thought about the other dimensions on why that is a terrible thing to say. And part of that was my class privilege as someone who grew up sort of upper middle class and didn't know any truck drivers on a personal level, right? It's a huge blind spot. So I'm telling this anecdote as a first year professor and fortunately my students <laughs> called me out on it and it was a huge, like talking about a huge disorienting learning moment, brain exploding, going in different directions. I'm still talking about it seven years to later today, right? <laughs> so diversity matters, right? But because there's so much, so diversity disrupts our assumptions, our autopilot, and but at the same time, our brains still need some system one. I mean, our brains still need to rely on system one just for day-to-day -day functioning. As I said, you don't want to be thinking deliberatively about how to drive, right? Or how to, you don't want your pilot to be thinking, okay, how do I turn this thing on, right? So system one is there, right? It's here to stay. Okay, so we go crazy without system one. But at the same time, system one explains why we have stereotypes, why we have things like implicit bias, why we have you know, all of these issues with police brutality and the disproportionate impact on communities of color. Because people have to make these split second decisions and they are tied deeply to race in our schemas. And I think it's also a lot harder to balance system two in a technology saturated 24 seven, go, 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 news cycle world, right? And so it really lends itself to another form of cognitive bias, which is called confirmation bias, where we seek out the information. We not only seek it out, but it seems more right to us, the information that confirms what we think we already know. It has major implications and explains a lot of problematic things. And on top of that, we mainly see our experience, right? We're an N of one. Okay, so I explained diversity, not uh, because of the social justice rationale, and then also because it interrupts our system one and can lead to higher order thinking, more complex ways of understanding the world. Okay, so if students of color are the ones who aren't pervasively self-segregating, is anyone on college campuses? And what the research tells us is that there probably are, we see the most trend, pronounced trends um, with historically white Greek life, and then there are some interesting trends that I'll talk about with religious student organizations. Although I will argue that one is a bigger deal than the other. You can guess which one, you don't have to say. Keep that in the back of your brain. And so in the book I talk about how there are some interesting dynamics, but I'll, I'll run through them today. Okay, so historically white Greek life has a complicated track record. It's generally linked with lower rates of interracial friendship with white students. Um, on studies looking at more casual forms of interracial contact, which is an actually really important outcome, um, there are mixed findings. Some studies find no net effect, which is positive or optimistic, and then other studies find negative effects, that they're less likely to interact um, across race. 
Uh, we have some studies that show at year three of college, um, this is Jim Sedanius's work, um, that participants uh, have negative attitudes towards interracial marriage. Participants in historically white Greek life, they're more likely to be opposed to just this idea that diversity can help campuses. They have higher levels on symbolic racism scales. So, And part of it is like people, I think, oftentimes are befuddled. Like, what is it about these groups that sometimes are making students worse, right, in first some outcomes. We know there's some good things, certainly, that come out of Greek life with leadership development and forming, forming relationships, positive relationship. But then we also know that there are, it's not just when it comes to race. It can be destructive norms like binge drinking, sexual assault, body image, um, just all sorts of things. So it's important to understand um, that groups matter, right? The sum of the whole actually can go beyond the individual, right? And so everyone wants to say, I'm not a racist, I'm not a racist, but suddenly when I'm with this group of people, I wanna sing this really problematic song that uses terrible language, right? And you know, there's a lot of really interesting stuff in the field of social, social psychology that talks about group dynamics, organizational culture, and unfortunately, the rule of the mob, if you've ever read Lord of the Flies or anything else, um, where when people get together, if there aren't people who are, and this is also part of why diversity can matter, because we know that more diverse viewpoints are more likely to say, hey, why are you doing that? Or isn't that kind of problematic? For instance, when we bring women into the organizations, um, we oftentimes see that impact. Um, and that might be why sometimes diversity is resisted because people like to do things the way they've always done them. Um, but yeah, groups have very powerful impacts on their members and there's a positive aspect of that. Certainly if anyone's worked, you know, with a community to mobilize, like it's exciting what a group can do and how you can feel, you know, more than just yourself when everyone works together. But unfortunately when it comes to destructive norms, and we also know that traditionally age college students, age 18 to 22, it's important, I think it's important to remember the prefrontal cortex does not fully develop, which regulates behavior, right, self-regulation and the ability to recognize like, oh, doing that crazy thing and posting it on social media is not a good idea. That doesn't fully develop till at least 25 and even beyond, right? So when you put 100 of them in a house together, <laughs> sometimes not good things happen. Okay, so just examples of some of the things that have come out of uh, Greek life. Uh, there's that terrible incident at the University of Oklahoma, just absolutely terrible. When I worked at Miami of University, or when I worked at Miami University, there was a sorority that trashed the National Museum of the Underground Railroad during their formal, their theme parties. There's just, and it's just like, who thinks this is an okay idea, right? And yet they happen over and over and over again. Okay. So why is this? Uh, part of it is because these environments can be particularly racially isolating for white students. And we do have data on this. So data from the National Longitudinal Study of Freshmen, they asked students to mark their different co-curricular involvements, and then they actually asked for information on the racial composition of those groups. And so it's Dr. Uh, Kim and I have done some good studies on that. So we found uh, for white students, 97.1% of white students who were involved in Greek life said they were involved in groups that were mostly or almost white. Um, in contrast, only about half of black students who were involved in Greek life said they did it in all black organizations, um, and then the number actually drops even lower for Asian Americans and Latinx. Um, Greek organizations, historically white ones, I would say they're sort of concentrated whiteness. Um, and I've done some research um, on sororities, and it was interesting because the most elite sororities were not just uh, mostly white, they were affluent and white, or all white. Um, and we have some also in other information research that talks about how it's not just white students who have the most racially homogeneous friendship groups. All they do, they do, but affluent white students have the most racially homogeneous friendship groups. So there's a lot of interplay that can happen between race and class. And in my research, I found that the sororities that were more racially diverse, people talked, the members talk, mentioned that they were also more open to other types of women. So whether it was uh, women from different SES backgrounds, women of different body types, body images, et cetera. Okay, so why does Greek life fly under the radar, right? Because I hear a lot, you know, I've never heard a, you know, I always hear like eat outside your comfort zone day, but I'm not even sure what the parallel would be with Greek life. But I've rarely heard, right, some sort of challenge of, hey, let's think about mantling, dismantling historically white Greek life on my campus, on your campus. So the role of cognitive bias. And so, all right, I have a fun video 
that is going to play somehow. And so, okay, this is tricky. This is a trick thing. Okay, <laughs> I shouldn't have said I'm going to trick you. Okay, <laughs> there's what we are going to see is, see is you're going to see a scene of two teams. I think one has the one definitely has white shirts, and one I think has black shirts, and they're going to be uh, tossing a basketball to one another. So there are two teams that are going to be throwing the basketball. So your job, I want you to take your pencil, pen, whatever. And I want you to mark how many times does the team with white shirts, how many passes do they make to one another? Got it? Got it? OK. It's participatory. You got to count. All right. YouTube magic. Go. This is a test of selective attention. <laughs> count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. Don't forget to count. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? This video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabri. And it's copyright. It is available for use in talks, training, and teaching on DVDs from VizCog Productions. They have a book. It's actually really good. OK. All right, so believe it or not, half of the part, this is why there's like a replication crisis in social psychology. But was there anyone who, I, be honest, I would love to hear, was there anyone who didn't see the gorilla? Hey, OK, good. This is good. You were evidence. Oh, well. Good, good. OK. But yeah, thank you. Thank you for your honesty. I appreciate it. Because in the lab setting, and maybe if I hadn't said there's going to be a trick, then maybe, that, maybe fewer of you would have picked up on it. Just remember, don't give it away. But in the lab setting, half of the participants missed the gorilla. Half of the participants. Thank you so much for those of you who raised your hands. OK, so <laughs> one of my theories for why Greek life might fly under the radar, so all of this is pointing to a concept called selective attention, which was pioneered by these psychologists, Christopher Chabras and Daniel Simons. Um, and it's the idea, basically, is we can't focus on more than one thing at once, or we have trouble, right? Which is why you shouldn't drive in text. It's bad. Um, but in terms of why does Greek life fly under the radar, well, I would argue sometimes it's maybe the gorilla, right? It's the gorilla or, um, you know, it's, it doesn't stick out for some reason. We focus on what's memorable or unusual to us. And it's funny that, you know, race in the cap, it's not that race in the cafeteria is more unusual than a gorilla, but <laughs> we focus on what's unusual. So race in the cafeteria, right? That's unusual to a lot of people. They're like, I'm not used to seeing a group of black people or a group of Asian Americans sitting together. That's a little weird to me, or that maybe even you know makes me feel like this isn't my cafeteria, et cetera. When under the radar, you might miss that there are these houses of like 100 students, most of whom are white. <laughs> right down Greek row, right, et cetera. So it's, it's this idea that, right, our brains trick us. And students of color are usually the ones who are pegged, right, as being the problem, the problem. They just stick to each other, right? When really we have, it's not that all is perfect with students of color and diversity and everything, but we have a lot of problems. <laughs> we have a lot of problems in higher education. And oftentimes, the media especially gets very tunnel vision, right, on this idea that diversity is counterproductive because students of color are just sticking to themselves, supposedly, when really there's another gorilla in the room. OK, so just to go over a little historical context, why is uh, historically white Greek life still majority white? Um, I would argue that there's some difficulty of grappling with the influence of the past when there is no formal exclusion. So when I did my interviews with students, a lot of people said, well, anyone can join. Well, anyone can join, right? Just because there used to be formal laws that said certain people couldn't join, and that was 50 years ago, so now it's better, right? When in reality, the past influences the present. And we know that this affects churches, right, where about 80% 
Um, and that number used to be even higher, up to 90%. At least 80% of churches are racially homogeneous. Um, and a lot of that stems back to official exclusion, where people of color were not allowed to attend certain congregations. OK. So it's interesting. There's this great book, uh, Alfred McClung Lee's Fraternities Without Brotherhood. It's published in the late 1950s. And he documents um, some of the shifting tides around race that affected these organizations. And he noted that by 1955, only one sorority, they wised up, right? So only one sorority had an official exclusionary policy towards people of color. And this book is fascinating because it documents like the crazy, terrible language that uh, Greek letter organizations used to exclude Negroes and Orientals and others. And they had huge conventions where they voted and people disagreed and everything. Um, so by 1955, only one sorority had an official books on the law, their law, um, that said no women of color. But they were all still white. History matters. Um, and Hurtado et al.'s Campus Racial Climate Framework talks about how the historical legacy of exclusion on a campus matters. And so it matters in so many ways, not just to the broader campus dynamics, but to the individual groups right, that exist on campus and who was able to join at one point. And it's not that everything can be linked back to history, but history right, and historical norms can set, the, set dynamics that influence present day organizational culture and how comfortable people feel about talking about race or what type of language they're able to draw on. Uh, certainly, what I think this has led to in historically white Greek life in general is uh, what I would say is an organizational culture of colorblindness, right? So it's this idea, well, we're not racist, so we can't, but we don't, we are not going to talk about race, and we're all right, white, we're all white, but we're not racist, <laughs> so everything is okay. And we can have a debate on, you know, the utility or usefulness of talking about racism in certain contexts, and um, because no one likes to be called racist, right? Um, but it's complicated. So, it's, so then we have racism, racism, or racial divisions without racists. And that gets very complicated, too. Unfortunately, the downside is this. When there's this schema in people's minds where I can only talk about race if there's racism. And I'm not a racist, and no one's a racist. So we're just not going to talk about race, period. <laughs> period. Like, we're just not going to talk about it at all. We're going to pretend it doesn't exist. And it was funny because actually I, when I did some of my research on Greek letter, letter groups, I was trying to get the demography at a particular institution of the individual groups. And um, a chapter president <laughs> reported me <laughs> to the National Panhel Organization. And I got this cease and desist letter. And in it, it said, we do not track any data. Anyone is allowed to join, et cetera. So what does that tell you? I don't know. OK. so. So as a result, right, and what are the other, OK, so if no one's a racist, no one is a racist. So what's the other narrative we have? Well, one I see is they blame students of color for not joining. They're like, we want to have everyone, but they don't want to join, <laughs> right? So that's another myth. And when we look at the data, so uh, what I hear is they have their own groups. They're all in their own groups, so they don't want to join our groups. And maybe there is some truth in that. But at the same time, the NLSF data tells us that for a lot of students of color that join Greek life, they don't join all black groups or all Asian American groups or all Latinx groups. They just don't join Greek life, period. And they especially are not going to think about joining traditionally white Greek life. So it's like, they're all in their own groups. They're like, actually, they're not. Some of them are in your groups. It's just that not a lot of them are going Greek, period. And there's other things like money and costs and fees and intersections with SES. But that's for another story. OK. So how do you counteract these forces? I'm curious, on your campuses, do any of you work with Greek life? A few? OK. One, two, OK. So you can bring this back. Well, number one is just to recognize that demography matters. And Dr. Kim and I did a study where she ran numbers and put them in a magical machine. And she found out that at more racially diverse institutions, the negative link between Greek life participation and interracial friendship is lessened. So in general, for the general sample, if students were involved in Greek life, they were less likely to have close friends of other races. But at more racially diverse institutions, this negative link between Greek life participation and interracial friendship was lessened. So it's the magic of structural equation modeling, which I think she's teaching some of you next week. Why is this so? The, here's the, my job is I bring the interpretation to the data. 
And so well, some of our suggestions is at these institutions, it might be harder for historically white Greek life to function as kind of this force field, right, where it becomes a bubble for students. It also just might be less of a dominant force on campus, so it's like one thing that people are involved in, but it's not their only thing. Okay. Um, Social economic diversity and its intersection with racial diversity and how that impacts Greek life is also important. Um, when social economic diversity is combined with racial diversity, it can challenge what I call, um, and I talk about this more in this book, what I call the consolidation of privilege. Because in general, we don't have just racial divisions on our campuses. We don't have just economic divisions. Sometimes economic divisions are layered on top of racial inequality. Um, and Greek life is a space where this happens, where the most elite organizations tend to not just be white, but they tend to be white and affluent, right? So you have a consolidation of both racial and economic privilege that's going on. When you have more diversity on your campus, both racially and socioeconomically, so in particularly when you have socioeconomic diversity within racial ethnic groups, so what it means to be white is not just being rich and white, but being low income, middle income, and upper income. And what it means to be black is not just Low income, it's middle income, upper income, right? We need this for all racial ethnic groups. When you have a broader mix of students, you have a more porous, really, environment for these interactions to take place because you have less of this layering of racial lines are layered with economic inequality lines. Yeah. It's a little tricky concept. I talk more about it in the book. Okay, other options. Get rid of it, always an option with Greek life and other destructive norms certainly persist uh, even regardless of the race stuff. Uh, in the book, I talk about some recommendations for institutions that do keep, choose to keep it. So recognizing that the past legacy of exclusion influences um, the present and to not skirt it and to give students language to talk about it and because isn't college supposed to be about learning <laughs> at the end of the day? Examine what language that students are using to talk about race and racial homogeneity and challenge it or give them food for thought, right? When, they have, when people throw out this, well, it's because they don't want to join. It's like, well, is that true, right? Um, and lastly, building opportunities for cross-racial engagement with these groups, right? So whether it's collaborations or meetings with NPHC groups or um, other multicultural Greek organizations um, or other ethnic student organizations on your campus. Um, and this is something I actually have seen um, and have seen it um, be pretty cool. Okay, so religious student organizations. Um, race and other spaces. In my studies with Dr. Kim, we also found in general a negative link between participating in religious student organizations and uh, the outcome of close interracial friendship. So you'd say, oh, what's going on with that, right? Well, we know that religion, as the entire first talk talked about, <laughs> is the often divided by race in US society. Um, and only about 14% of religious communities in the country are multiracial. So a lot of the pre-college socialization that students are getting in religious communities tends to be same race. And so this is for people of color, and there are reasons why that is, and that is also true in general for white people, and there are complicated reasons for why that is. Okay, so is it all bad? No. Immigrant communities are a critical bedrock of support, and um, communities of color, that's my entire first talk. Um, and like ethnic student organizations, same race or similar race religious organizations can also provide breathing space and refueling room, right, for students. So whether it's, you know, singing in a gospel choir or being in the Asian American Christian Fellowship, right, that's not your entire life, right, that's probably an hour or two, maybe once a week. Okay, I talked about this pre-college stuff. Okay, we found that uh, white students are most likely to participate in same race religious organizations. So they are not to the same extent that Greek life is, but it is a more racially uh, isolating environment for white students than other students of color, than Asian Americans, and then I think black and Latinx students. Okay. So there are some findings uh, that I want to unpack really quickly. And so in general, uh, studies I did with Dr. Kim, we found that um, there was a negative link between religious student organization participation and interracial friendships. So if you participate in these groups, you are less likely to have close interracial friendships. However, in another study, we found that students who identified as more religious generally um, had higher levels of cross-racial interaction. What do you make of that? Um, and there was no effect, no net effect on general cross-racial interaction. And then also religious minorities in particular, students who are Hindu, Muslim, et cetera, they had higher levels of cross-racial interaction too, and that's even when you accounted for race. 
So the story is religious student organization participation, lower, close interracial friendship, but higher, or if you're more religious, for being more religious, higher, more casual contact. And so actually, in the story that we tell, I tell in the book um, and in some of my other work, is we talk about how um, involvement in these religious student organizations, they might influence your closer, if they're more racially homogeneous, they might influence your closer friendship network. So your close friends um, are more likely to be same race. However, it doesn't seem to be preventing broader cross-racial interaction, which is actually a really good thing because we see higher levels of benefits that are linked with the more casual le um, level of interracial contact. And part of that is because of when going back to the benefits of diversity and how those things work, those tend to come from encounters that um, can spur cognitive dissonance. Um, and more casual encounters, you can have more of them, right? So you're increasingly exposed to non-redundant information, information that is different, right? When you have a broader network of diverse peers. And that's really important. On one hand, interracial friendship is a beautiful thing, but at the same time, you can only have so many close friends, right? And you learn their story and that's great, but you only have so many. Versus if you are constantly interacting across race, regardless of the race ethnicity of your close friendship, you're being exposed to hopefully non-redundant redundant information, information from diverse viewpoints, et cetera. And so it's really important to be able to have that casual network of interracial, uh, casual, um, and but also meaningful network of um, interracial contact. And so that's also a similar story for ethnic student organizations, where it's not, it's no problem if your best friends are Asian or for me or, you know, of your same race, that's no problem. It's that you need to have that accompanied with a broader network of diverse peers. And so that's why or, uh, racial diversity in the workforce is especially important because we know that's a huge avenue where people are more likely to have sort of more casual interactions, um, et cetera. Okay. So, interestingly enough, those who identify as religious tend to have, it seems, higher levels of more casual cross-racial interaction, which is a good thing, um, and also higher cross-racial interaction for religious minorities. Okay, so you can have both, right, with religious student organization. You can have same race and interracial interaction and friendship. This is especially important for students of color. Um, and white students also need to be especially proactive on the interracial part, because what we see with the patterns with white students in general is that sometimes they lack both the interracial friendship and the interracial contact. Um, you need both, right? Okay, and the status quo of people in general is that they hang out with people who are like them, so there's a lot institutions need to do to counteract them. Um, it doesn't need to be 24-7 interracial interaction um, but there does need to be some level of that. And that can be done. The research shows that things like, for instance, interracial roommate pairings have a big impact on the racial diversity of people's networks. It can be done by supporting things like service learning, the, having a diverse classroom, and so especially the demography of the institution is essential because without diverse students, you can't have diverse interactions. Okay, all right. Okay, so wrapping it up, Thinking of who's, quote, self-segregating, it's easy to miss the gorilla. Thank you for the honest of you, uh, those of you who were able to say um, that you did not see the gorilla because you're in good company. System one is very strong, right? And for good reason. And same race community needs to be paired with interracial engagement. And so thinking of system one is strong, so thinking of, well, how are you going to go to system two? So you don't want to be all system one. So think what checks and balances do you have in place, right? So you are looking to system two. So you don't want to can your system one, but you do need to have resources that can help you think about system two. And so with that, it's sort of a commercial sometimes to slow down. I know it's hard. Or to seek out especially viewpoints of people that you know are um, going to disagree with you or maybe are going to challenge you or push you to see an issue in a different way. Those are some of the precautions that we can take. Okay. Engaging with the devil's advocate. Recognizing that we are irrational to begin with. <laughs> You know, um, recognizing also in the book I talk about information, unfortunately information on its own does not always change minds. We think it's the answer. Good information is the necessary, it's absolutely necessary, but I'd say it's insufficient. So there are all the other things that we need to think about creatively to think how can we get people to believe good information or information that is correct. And then seeking out the data from multiple sources. 
All right, so in closing, um, don't be afraid to find your own blind spots, because that's actually a cognitive bias called bias blind spot, <laughs> blind spot bias, and we all have them. Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winner who wrote this huge book, talks about his own blind spots, right? So if he has them, I'm proud to have them too. And certainly the importance of seeking out the outsider, the marginalized, and bringing them to the table, um, because that is what is going to push us um, to be able to see the world differently than our own silos. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. You want to stay up there for a minute and do, we'll, we'll allow for uh, maybe one or two questions before uh, we, we close things off. So are there questions that you want to ask of anything she's raised in this last one? Hi, I'm Candy Mink Salas. I'm on faculty here in the department. Um, I'm wondering if you've done any work with college or university administrators, um, particularly in student affairs and student life, around this idea of dismantling um, student organization systems that are monolithic culturally and racially? So, um, so working with student affairs administrators, basically, especially around historically white Greek life and some of those, you know, not a lot on the ground, actually. And so that's, that's a challenge, um, which is why it's great to be in a room of budding scholar practitioners who I hope can take some of these ideas or run with them. Um, but I have done a little bit of work, I'd say, you know, just in conversations, right? But in terms of actually concerted efforts, a little less. But it would be, it would be a growing opportunity and a challenge, I think, to be able to think, I mean, it's a privilege of the academics. Sometimes we can study these things from afar, but I know on the ground things are messier and there are a lot of political realities with these groups. Um, so yeah, I would welcome the opportunity, certainly. She's available for hire as a consultant. <laughs> my name is Justin Yule. Whoa, I'm um, sorry about that. And my question is regarding the benefits um, minoritized communities have engaging with the dominant culture at the university campus. You mentioned the black student city at the tables. We live in a country where I have full access, let me not say full access, but I have a lot of access to uh, white culture. I see it on TV, I get it great from the schools. I can see the benefits of dominant culture, um, kind of seeing our point of view. But what, we get stung a lot. Why do I need to continue to subject myself to that? Should I just go to an HBCU? It's complicated, I mean, that's a conversation I'd probably like to have more like over tea or versus on the podium. But I mean, I don't think it's an either or, right? And I think there's certainly plenty of benefits to attending an HBCU, certainly. Um, but it is complicated. And I think y here at APU, for those of you who do come from a faith background, you do have some benefits of, you know, what does it mean to give something to people who might not deserve it, right? Um, there are some, um, there are some, scaffolding that you might have to be able to do that. Um, so is your question basically what, if you are in a minoritized position, what do you benefit from interacting with the dominant culture because you do that all the time anyway? Is that sort of the question? I, I just see the risk. I mean, if I'm going to choose between a fraternity as an undergrad, yeah, yeah. I mean, I know that there's options. I can, cho I can choose a, a predominantly white or I can choose a black, but what is, what, how do I benefit because I can see the, the, the benefit from dominant culture adopting and becoming more familiar with the various sure. experiences. I have that experience as a black man in America. I have become familiar. I'm not an expert, but I've become familiar. Yeah. And in that process, I've gotten stung. Why continue to do this? Because sometimes it seems as if the diversity and the multiculturalism that we seek is really for the benefit of white students. Mm -hmm. Not for me, because you're still gonna yeah. talk bad about me when I leave. Yeah. Okay, now I understand your comment and question a little better. Yeah, I would say, I mean, the question is how do we make it work better, right? That our existing systems are flawed and broken. Um, and certainly a lot of it is the burden is put disproportionately on students of color. And so in terms of what obligation do you have to do additional like cross-racial engagement? I would say it, it just varies individual by individual, but I don't know if there's 
it's life, right? Like we're gonna be interacting across race. Like even if I spent tons of time with my Asian American family and my Asian American church and my Asian American friend group, I'm still constantly <laughs> interacting with dominant society. So I'd say for the person, I mean, it's all about the choice of how you want to balance those worlds. And I don't think, I mean, white people or the dominant population is in the privilege where they can opt into those opportunities. I'm not sure we always have that choice, right, to opt in. If anything, we can occasionally, occasionally choose to opt out, right? But in terms of how much ability we have to do that, I think is, is just really dependent on an individual's context. And so I absolutely agree, you know, the norm is, right, for people, students of color especially, is just, you know, racial battle fatigue, right, is one of the handy terms that summarizes um, what so many of our students of color go through on all those institutions. So I would say for them, especially things like ethnic student organizations, a black fraternity or an Asian American sorority or something like that, those are critical, critical resources just for everyday survival. And so what is your obligation? I mean, you do what you need to do to go where you need to go. And so for that person, right, thinking of my imaginary student, I might say, like, on one hand, you need to do things to survive, right? And so part of that survival will probably include same race community, and I encourage you to find that um, and to make those friendships and connections and find, you know, your spaces where you will be challenged in other ways, certainly, right, whether it's across gender, across other issues, but you need that time where you're not having to constantly answer questions about your race ethnicity. At the same time, I would say, okay, you also want to be realistic and think about what are your goals, right, and thinking about is there some value in having a diverse social network for advancement into the work field, for thinking about the connections you might need to have to get letters of recommendation or graduate school or peer networks, et cetera, and to recognize that there can be, but that doesn't mean you have to put your whole life, right, <laughs> into those relationships necessarily, but to recognize that, yeah, there is some utility because we do live in an in a unequal society, essentially. But I would say number one is survival, right? If you don't survive, you can't do anything. Um, and so for me, especially, I mean, for me specifically, same race community has been a space of survival um, and a space of, um, yeah, being able to make it through predominantly white spaces. Um, it's not everything, but it is a huge part of my life. Thank you so much, Julie. Let's give her another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.